This will be an updated getting started guide including the new R Factor 2 user interface and some additional topics not covered in my original video. I'll include links to this tutorial and my dedicated server tutorial below. So if you know someone who is interested in R Factor 2, wants help getting started or is already playing it but could maybe use some tips, then please share the links with them. R Factor 2 is available for Windows PCs from Steam and once installed by default it will offer the updated user interface. For a while you may find the old user interface is still available to install. If you right click on R Factor 2 in your Steam library and select properties and then betas the old UI branch may still be listed. Note however that it's listed as depreciated so it's being phased out and is based on an older build of the game so it's not advisable to use it anymore. When starting R Factor 2 the only other option will be the graphics configuration dialog. So you click play then select the option and click play again. You may choose to run the game in windowed or borderless mode to make it easier to alt tab out of the game should you ever need to do so. And these are my current settings for a Ryzen 5 3600X with an RTX 2060 Super and 16 gigs of RAM. And then of course, to start the game proper, you just choose play R Factor 2. Note that you can also start a Steam game by right clicking on the Steam icon in your Windows taskbar. When first starting the game, to create a new player profile, you'll be asked to input your name. The new user interface contains quick link sections at the top such as R Factor 2, Race, Watch and Community. R Factor 2 is your start page for everything, so it includes links to Race, Watch and Community as well, along with content and news sections. Clicking on any news item displays that content along with access to content from the studio397.com website, including the official forums and user guides etc. The race section of the R Factor 2 main page is effectively a shortcut to the race section above, and the same goes for the watch and community sections. Content will cover in more detail later. A note that as R Factor 2 is the main screen, the exit game option on the lower right of the screen is only available through this R Factor 2 section. The only other options present on the main screen are the alerts window, settings and player profile. Before we start, we could check that your mouse cursor is visible making it easier to navigate the UI. By default, pressing the delete key shows or hides the cursor. If the cursor is not visible, then go to settings and then assign, and select any of the available controller profiles on the left and click load. And on the right, if you scroll to the base of the display section, toggle cursor should be assigned to the delete key. The first section in settings is the summary page, which provides an overview of your current settings and quick links to each section. So to access controller calibration, we can click the button in the summary page, or use the calibrate button below, and then return to the settings summary page, and use the button on the lower left corner of the screen or the arrow that appears on the left side of the screen. Note that the arrow in the upper left corner takes you out of the settings section, while all other links in the page allows you to navigate the settings pages. 
We'll begin by going to the Assign section to set up our controls. Currently loaded is a custom profile for a Thrustmaster TSPC racer. Note that the JSON files behind these profiles are stored in the user data folder inside your R-Factor 2 installation. So maybe back up any custom profiles you've spent time creating, should you ever need to make a change to the drive you have R-Factor 2 installed on. Note that before setting up any controller, you must first connect it to the PC before starting the game. If you check the top of the Assign page, you'll see if your controllers have been detected or not. Now that I've connected the controller and started the game, at the top of the Assign page, we can see the detected controllers. You can also click Detect if necessary. In this example, it states no controller found, although they are. I assume it's the TH-8A shifter being detected as T500RS and which is already working. An R-Factor 2 installation includes a list of pre-configured controller profiles. We'll select the default profile for a Thrustmaster TSPC racer, load it and then begin the calibration process. Note on the right, as I load the default profile, the assignments for the H-Pattern shifter in the driving section are removed, so we would need to set those up as well. We switch to the calibration page and begin by checking that the max left and right matches the max rotation of our wheel. Then check throttle and brake. The clutch hasn't been assigned, so we go to Assign and under Driving select Clutch and click to assign it. We then return to Calibrate where the clutch is now detected. And before proceeding we save the profile we're currently working on. We can save to the original file or create a custom version if we want to keep the original in place. Note that the max rotation of your wheel is also based on the steering wheel range the game is currently using. With vehicle set enabled, the game will set the wheel range based on the currently selected car. Or you can disable it and set the wheel range manually. And here you can see where the control panel for the wheel in Windows has also been modified by the game to match the wheel rotation. A note that as you need to connect your controllers to Windows before starting the game, that modifying the wheel settings via its control panel while the game is already running may also cause issues. For example, you get in the car and there's no force feedback or something like that. Now this depends on the wheel or drivers or even the game currently in use, but it's just something to keep in mind. Now we'll quickly change the car to the Corvette C8 and upon returning to the calibration page, we can see that the rotation value has changed based on vehicle set being enabled and in the wheels control panel too as it should be. And a quick note on force feedback, which in this example is set to wheel of course. Most of my settings are the defaults in this case. The visual settings relate to motion within the car cockpit when braking or moving over bumps. Head physics is simulated motion of the driver's head combined with head vibration, which is based on the aerodynamic properties and the engine of the car you are driving. Here's an example of the Cadillac DPI at Sebring. Head vibration was set to aero in brackets all, which I think is the default. On the left, head physics is set to zero and on the right to 100%. The use of these features will be up to personal preference and the settings you can tweak to your own preferences and hardware setup, such as single or triple screens or VR. And for each input, you can set a min or max value. For example, if you want to reduce the travel of the clutch or brake pedal to around 50%. 
If you're driving a manual shifting car and you find that you're missing shifts, you could reduce the amount you need to press the pedal to reach 100%. And to reset the pedal, press it all the way and press set max again. The assign page where you set up your individual controls may take some time to become familiar with. We'll first check that the controller profile we want to use is loaded. The controls are categorized into driving, features, display, other and chat. Based on the predefined controller we started with, the control section of driving should already be configured. Well, other than the clutch that we had to set up earlier, of course. By default, the H pattern shifter isn't set up, so we'll do that now. And remember to save the profile once you've made any changes. I've noticed now that the key binding for neutral is empty for some reason. In my regular profile, it is set to the N key, since my shifter doesn't have an axis for neutral. I'm not sure if it's necessary to have, so long as you engage the clutch, for example when driving a manual shifting car. We'll anyway assign it to the N key. I'm no expert when it comes to using the list of controls here, many of them I've never even used. And don't be intimidated by the long list of items here if you're just getting started, since most cars don't use all of the options anyway. Under driving are of course the basic driving controls. The rest are listed as other. Traction control override I've never used. It's supposed to override traction control giving you full access to the power of the wheels, where traction control would normally be active. I think it may only apply to certain car types. Launch control I've also never used, and I'm not aware of any cars that currently support it. Speed limiter I use regularly to control pit lane speeds. Most modern cars support the use of it. Brake bias is a commonly used function and is one you may wish to map to buttons on your wheel. The boost controls I've never really used. I assume these relate to cars with turbos. And power demand I've also not used. Increment and decrement mixture is used by both ICUs and electric cars in R Factor 2. And with electric cars, it controls your engine power. Anti-roll bar or track bar controls I've never really used either. Total noob here. Engine brake map up and down are also used by electric cars and are the battery regeneration settings. Setting it high means that you get more regeneration back into your battery, but the car will not be as fast. Traction control and ABS you may be utilizing a lot. So it might be useful to map these to buttons on a wheel. And these controls also appear in the features list, since they relate to the difficulty settings where you can set traction control and ABS to high, medium, low or off. And I think that if you wish to use traction control and ABS via the controls in the driving list, you should use the features controls to disable them as part of the difficulty settings, so that you have full control over those settings. Arm attack mode is used by the Gen 2 Formula E cars and on those Formula E tracks that support the feature. Then there's the standard manual shifter assignments that we've already configured. Actually, if you don't happen to have a manual shifter, it might be an idea to map the reverse gear to a wheel or keyboard, since sometimes, at least for me, some cars don't go into reverse when using the sequential shifting paddles. And auto reverse, if you're not using it, is currently the one difficulty setting that cannot be mapped as a control. Ignition and starter can be useful to have if you're driving in full manual mode and happen to stall the car or something. Headlights of course are necessary 
since R Factor 2 supports day to night cycles. Handbrake and flap controls I've never really used. And wipers and pit requests are of course necessary for rainy conditions and visiting the pits. The alt controls I don't think I've ever used and since I use track IR sometimes, I don't really use the look controls either. The features section is important to note, and as we've already mentioned, the controls here relate directly to the options included in the difficulty page. We'll show a quick comparison of the assign features list and the difficulty page. Although they're not in the same order, all 11 options in the features list appear in the difficulty page as well. And all of these can be controlled on the fly while you're out on track. And if you wish to have full use of traction control and ABS as they appear in the driving list, you should disable them using the controls here. By default, they will use the function keys on your keyboard, but of course you can map them to any key or button you like. The list of display controls you'll no doubt be using quite frequently. And as it states at the top of the list, the first batch of controls are the in-car list. The seat controls are for adjusting the driver's seat up, down, forward and back. and the FOV or field of view controls of course, which are necessary to adjust your view when driving a new car for the first time. A note here that the word pitch in brackets indicates that you hold the shift key to use the FOV controls to change the pitch of the driver's seat. The toggle controls are usually pre-assigned to the number of keys on your keyboard. Toggle mirrors is easy to understand and you keep pressing the assigned key until you get the mirror arrangement you like best. And on the topic of mirrors are the hard-coded controls for adjusting your mirrors which work in tandem with the seat adjustment controls which in most cases default to your keyboard arrows. You hold the control key and use the arrow keys to adjust your left side mirror. And hold the shift key and use the arrow keys to adjust your center mirrors. and hold the ALT key and use the arrow keys to adjust your right side mirror. The center mirror adjustments apply to any real mirrors. Any LCD displays, such as in a GTE car, and the virtual mirrors as well. Note that if you change the seat adjustment keys to something else, you must use those keys in combination with the shift, alt and control keys to adjust your mirrors. And in addition, since the shift, alt and control keys are hard coded to adjust the mirrors, assigning them to some other function might mess with the mirror adjustment. So keep that in mind just in case. Toggle hood stats is the horizontal bar that appears at the lower center of the screen, showing the relative position of the cars out on track. 
position 1 will appear in green, and you, the player driver, will appear in red. And when active, a safety car will appear in grey. Toggle Hood Tack is the virtual tack that appears in the centre of the screen, along with session info that appears around the centre mirror position in the upper middle of the screen. Now this can be customised by adding items from the Steam Workshop, so depending which HUD mod and which version of that mod you're using, you might get both options or only the virtual tack. If the car you're driving includes a digital display with similar information, you could just disable the HUD tack and use that instead. Toggle HUD MFD, where MFD is multifunctional display, is the element which appears on the lower right of the screen. I don't actually know what toggle overlays is supposed to do, although it's usually assigned to key number 7. Display vehicle labels will place driver details above the cars you see around you. This feature is currently disabled in the game, while they work on creating a replacement design for it. I'll pin a comment below and update the comment once the feature has been replaced. Display mode allows you to page through the data available through the HUD MFD. Pit menu up, down and increment allows you to set up your changes via the pit display options before entering the pits. Message history recalls the latest message in the box on the lower left that displays session information. The remaining controls in this list control what is displayed in the HUD MFD on the lower right including the pit display. Effectively a shortcut to each page available or you can just use display mode to page through them. And of note is the driving aids option, which as part of the HUD MFD will display which of the difficulty settings you have enabled via the features controls. The camera settings are useful mostly for creating replays and spectating etc. Driving cameras is pretty much the only camera control I include in my main controls profile to switch between the cockpit views. And to make things simple, if you plan to create replays, which we'll take a look at later, you could create a custom controller profile just for creating replays, where you're free to use all the keys on your keyboard or buttons on your wheel and maybe a game controller as well. And you would just load up that profile anytime you wanted to create replays or custom screenshots or something like that. If you want to use a chase cam style view, for example if driving using a gamepad or for a better view of a track, then use the camera change control. Sometimes for certain car types on certain tracks, using this view can be useful. And the field of view controls can also be used when in the camera change view. And then at the end is the toggle cursor control we mentioned at the start, which you can use at any time. Assign Other contains a miscellaneous list of controls, including some options for VR users. I'm not familiar with many of these, 
so I'll just quickly list those that I actually use myself. Toggle AI Control allows the AI to take control of your car and you can toggle it on and off as you please. It might be useful for testing or creating custom replays etc. Some controls are disabled while using it though and I don't think your car can pit when in this mode. Instant Replay allows you to watch a replay of 10 to 180 seconds which you can specify in your replay settings. And while the instant replay is running, you have full control of the replay camera change functions. You can start and stop the instant replay at any time, and when you return to the track, you'll be where you were when the instant replay started. Pause will pause the current session. It will literally freeze the current session without any UI prompt. And using pause again will continue the session. Skip formation allows you to skip a formation lap and just start the race. Restart race will restart a single player race session. Screenshot defaults to F12, which I think is also the Steam default for taking screenshots. The screenshots are then stored in a folder inside the user data folder in your RFactor 2 installation. Time acceleration is useful, and note that you assign a key and then use Ctrl plus that key to use it. So if it's the X key, you press Ctrl plus X to activate it. And you can use it in particular to complete a qualifying session for a race against AI, or at any time you choose when racing against AI. And then there are some other controls including replay controls, which you may wish to include in a custom replay controller profile, if you plan to create one. And finally, the list of chat and voting options to use when joining multiplayer servers. The graphics page is an extension of the graphics configuration dialog we looked at when first starting the game. And again, these are my current settings. And as I noted earlier, set your window mode to windowed or borderless if you plan to alt tab out of the game on a regular basis. The settings you apply in display will depend on your PC setup, and these you may need to tweak depending on which car, track, weather conditions and the number of opponents you wish to include in a session. Stabilize Horizon locks your eyes to a fixed point on the horizon. Use this in combination with the head physics and head vibration features we looked at earlier. Here's an example of the 911 GT3 Cup at Lime Rock Park. Head physics I set to 100% and on the left, stabilize horizon is set to off and on the right it's set to high. It's very subtle in this example, but there is a difference. It may prove of benefit to VR users in some scenarios. It's one of the settings you can adjust on the fly while you're driving. Some settings you can adjust while you're out on the track, while others you'll need to set before you load into a session. The showroom in use can either be the stock option or something added via the Steam Workshop. Visible Vehicles controls the number of vehicles visible around you when you're out on track, not to be confused with the amount of AI vehicles in a single player race, in that you can add 20 AI to a race, but have only 10 visible around you when out on track. Reducing the amount of visible vehicles may help with your graphics performance. The Message Center is the message box that appears on the lower left corner 
when you're driving and applying controls. The hood selection can again either be a stock option or added via the Steam Workshop. And I have my default view set to cockpit. You can enable mirrors here and controls for both the camera view and mirrors are available under the display section of the assigned page. Using the steering wheel option, I usually disable the virtual driver arms and the field of view can also be modified using the increase and decrease FOV controls. Auto detail FPS will adjust the detail of objects based on the value you specify. If you want to try it, perhaps set it to match the refresh rate of your monitor, for example a value of 60, to see if that helps. However, most likely, just dialing down the graphical effects would be a better way to improve your frame rate. Download custom skins can be enabled, if you want to add custom skins when joining a multiplayer server. Wait for plugins forces the game to wait for every plugin to load I've had no issues with it set to off. Transparent Trainer enables a ghost car and lead time sets the default lead for the ghost car. When set to best, it will record your lap times and use your best lap time when displaying the trainer on track. Note that the display settings can be changed on the fly when you're in a session, but not all options are available. Here you can see the list available while driving, and then highlighted in the full list of display settings, those that are included, so you can see which settings you would need to apply before loading into a session. With the sound settings, first set your speaker configuration, for example headphones. Then set your race spotter preferences and the spotter volume, in this case up to 100%. Outside, outside, three wide inside, outside, outside. Overall, you'll most likely have to tweak the settings to get them right for you. Tire volume, which some say you should have dialed up, goes up to a value of 400%, as does the opponent ratio volume, and which you might want to dial up in order to hear the sounds of the cars around you. And the option's sound volume, for where it's relevant, you can leave at the default or disable, I guess. And note that the option's sound and speaker configuration cannot be configured if you exit to the settings when you're in a race session. The difficulty screen we've already looked at briefly in relation to the features section of the assign settings page. And if we again compare the assign features list to the difficulty page, we can see that we can assign controls to all options except auto reverse. When out on track, you can use the driving aids view in the hood MFD to see which of these options you have enabled. And keep in mind that not all cars support all controls. For example, some cars don't support ABS. And here you can see on the lower right of the screen, the hood MFD displaying the features currently enabled and we can at any time pause the session and go to the settings and difficulty and for example disable traction control and upon returning to the session the hood MFD will display the change or we can use the features controls in this case the presets of F6 and F7 to control invulnerability and auto shifting 
If you don't have invulnerability enabled, you can set a damage multiplier. The AI strength, aggression and limiter we'll look at in more detail later when discussing setting up single player races. Some of these features might be useful to enable when first starting out. For example, if you're just getting used to driving with a wheel or using a gamepad. Auto pit lane can be useful if you don't know your way out of the pits on a circuit. Although for some circuits, using the AI control instead might be more accurate than auto pit. And keep in mind that if you enable ABS or traction control here, it may override any manual settings of those controls, so make sure and disable them if you want full control of those features. And finally, and something we'll cover when looking at setting up a race, when in a race session, you can still edit the difficulty settings except for the AI strength and the AI limiter. In the replay settings, you can enable replays and set the quality. Enabling hot laps is, I think, recording a replay of the best lap at any circuit. And you can set the length of instant replays as well. The plugins are optional. Track IR I use myself, so that's enabled here. Stock car rules is for stock car sessions where features like yellow flags and double file restarts are included. Such options are used by some online leagues. A knockout qualifying allows you to set up qualifying sessions with knockout elements. Both are most likely not relevant for the casual user. The network settings default to 256 kilobits per second, I think, so you may want to increase the limits. What you set will depend on the maximum speed your internet connection supports. So if you share an internet connection or have bandwidth restrictions in place, don't set the values too high. Perhaps start with one to two megabits per second. And if you experience any issues when joining multiplayer, then try increasing it. R Factor 2 comes with a selection of content and you can then add content by either purchasing paid DLC or adding content from the Steam Workshop. We'll use the native Steam client to display these options. However, they are also available in-game via the content section using the Steam Overlay feature. If the Steam Overlay isn't already enabled, it will prompt you to enable it first. Then upon restarting the game, you'll be able to browse the Steam Workshop and item stores for R Factor 2 while in the game, and use the shortcut of Shift plus Tab to close the Steam overlay. To check out the paid DLC options, visit the R Factor 2 store page and click on the Available Items section. Steam will let you know if you've already purchased an item. So look for the item is in your inventory banner. And to check all that you already own, click your name above and select inventory. And in the R Factor 2 tab, you'll see all your content. You can then return to the library view and from R Factor 2, click to access the workshop. Under browse, you can check the items you're already subscribed to. And to add an item, just browse for one and click subscribe. And later, if that item is updated, you'll automatically receive that update via Steam. Note that when Studio 397 
releases additional free content for R Factor 2, you should be automatically subscribed to it and Steam will download and install it for you. So keep an eye out for any content being added when you're starting up the game. And when there is a major update released, content from the in-game news section will be shown after any content updates have been installed. And any content being added will most likely be mentioned by rfactor2 on Twitter, the studio397.com website, of course, and perhaps also on racedepartment.com. I'll include links below. And an additional note related to content. Currently, when joining a multiplayer server, any cars or tracks that you don't already have will be downloaded and installed to your rfactor2 directory. A note that the content is also added to the packages directory inside your rfactor2 installation. In this example, the car and track that installed when I joined the server are also in the Steam Workshop. However, currently joining a server does not also subscribe you to any content that might also be in the workshop. And since the content has already been installed, but I'm not subscribed to those items, I wouldn't receive any possible updates to those items. So since I wish to keep the content and also have a way of managing which cars and tracks I have installed, I'll subscribe to them in the workshop as well. There's an extra element of content that I wanted to cover and it's something I personally didn't fully understand until I'd created the dedicated server guide and that's the R Factor 2 series concept. As an example, someone playing R Factor 2 joins a multiplayer server and then later just wants to select content for a single player race. However, when they go to select cars and tracks what they see is the content they were using when they were on the multiplayer server. What's happened here is that the package from the multiplayer server was installed and became the default series. And to return to the default setup, they would need to select all tracks and cars to replace the default series. Now, in order to better understand this, it might be an idea to check the dedicated server tutorial I created, which explains in detail how the packages to populate the series list are created. Basically, the same tools you use to create multiplayer server content can be used to create a single player series. We'll quickly show the concept once more. To begin, in the new user interface from the main page, click on all tracks and cars or whichever is the currently selected series. In this example, you can see that all tracks and cars is the currently selected series. And beside that is a series that installed after I had joined the multiplayer server. And another from a server I created using the dedicated server tools. And if I switch to either of these additional series, the only selectable cars and tracks for single player racing is whatever was included inside that series. And to get access to all tracks and cars again, I would need to reselect that series. So we'll go to the support folder inside our R Factor 2 installation and from the tools folder, launch the MAS2 app. We first check that the packages directory in use is the one inside our rfactor2 installation, just in case we've been running the dedicated server app on the same PC. Then we'll quickly create a mod package for LMP cars at SPA.
We then go to the bin64 folder inside our R Factor 2 installation and launch the Mod Manager app. Note that the directories in the lower right of the app should be pointing to the root of your R Factor 2 installation and the packages folder there. And with only mods selected above, we can see the installed package for the multiplayer server we joined, another server that I hosted myself and the package we just created to act as a single player series. And for each item selected, you'll see the contents of the package in the window on the lower right. And if we then return to the game and exit so that we can restart it to load this new package, we can select this custom series And when we go to set up a single player session, we just need to select from the content we added to that series. I guess one way where it might be useful is when selecting opponents for a race since you'll only need to select from the list of cars you added to that series. And when a custom series package with less content than all tracks and cars is selected, it will reduce your game's startup times, since there can be less content to load. Another area where using a custom series for single player content is useful is the potential to create a custom race season, however currently with some limitations. Here you can see a dedicated server being set up and you can arrange the events on the right as you wish. For example, the custom series season begins with Sebring. And here the server admin can start the next session and anyone in the session will be loaded into the next event. And in this example, we'll use the dedicated server tools to create a custom endurance racing series for GTE cars, but we're not able to arrange the order of the tracks. And here we can see two custom series added, one from a multiplayer server we joined and another from the custom series we just created. In all cases, the track listing is alphabetical so currently we cannot run the custom offline championship using the track order we would like. And currently when running one of these custom series, and if we try to use the race monitor to select the next track, it will not work. I will pin a comment to the video and add a note once this feature has been fixed. And of course moving forward, it would be nice to have the race events in a custom single player series to occur in the order we would like. Now over time between joining multiplayer servers and perhaps also creating custom packages for yourself, your series list may fill up. And then what should you do if you wish to remove some items? The installed series elements are stored in the RFM folder inside your installed directory. And the related packages used to create the series will be in your packages folder. And if we use the mod manager app again, we can see how the mods listed there relate to the contents of our RFM folder. And if we wish to delete any entries, we select them one by one and click uninstall, meaning to uninstall the content as an install series. And then again selecting one by one and clicking delete will remove them from the packages folder. Now still in the packages folder are the packages for the car and track added when we joined the multiplayer server that served as content 
we didn't already have, and which you'll recall we subscribed to in the Steam Workshop. And since we no longer need to retain these packages, using the Mod Manager, we select the components list, locate the car and track packages, and delete them. And if you plan to use the series concept for single player, it might be an idea to regularly recreate any series content you use, since when creating a package, you should select the latest version of each content item. And over time, as content is updated, you'll want the series you're using to contain the latest version of each item. And now, when we start R Factor 2 again and check our series list, only all tracks and cars is available as it should be. If you plan to use the tools to create and manage series content, then perhaps create a folder on your desktop and call it R Factor 2 Series Creation. And in there, place shortcuts to the Mod Manager and Mass tools. Since to start with, it can be tricky just to remember where they're located. How you manage your content packages will, I guess, depend on the tools that you're used to using. In my case, I'm familiar with the server setup process and tools, so I tend to use that. I should mention, though, that there is a version of the Mod Manager tool available in-game which is accessible via the content section of the R Factor 2 start page. When first using it, you may wish to place it in list view mode, or whatever works best for you. And you can either use this tool, or the separate mod manager app, or a combination of both. When setting up a single player race session from the main screen, there are a couple of ways to begin. From the main screen on the race, on the right, you'll see your last used configuration, including the series, car and track. And clicking race below will start a session using the last used configuration listed above. Or we can select customize to either customize a single player session or join a multiplayer session. And note how race on the upper left now appears selected, since selecting customize on the previous page has taken us to race. And the same elements listed under our last used configuration are now presented vertically, with the current selected series and from that series the currently selected track and car. Note on the right, in the race view, is the competition system. I'll include the link below to an overview by Michi Hoyer, since the competition system is intended for more advanced players. I've been told that the competition system has the ability to prompt you to subscribe to or purchase any content you might need to join an online competition event. And if you happen to click on competition, use the colored links on the upper right to jump back to multiplayer or single player. Before continuing with setting up a single player session, we'll quickly change the currently selected series from the custom one I created back to the default of all tracks and cars. And we'll then begin by selecting the track and car for a single player event. By default, the track selection view will be this horizontal grid type view and where the select button will be in the center of the screen. A note that you can select to view all tracks within the currently selected series from either the top or the bottom left. There is then another horizontal grid view where the select button will be left of center and where to view all tracks Within the currently selected series, you select from the upper left only. And finally, 
and one I'm more familiar with, I guess, is a list view. And again, the select button is placed left of center. And note how in the top left, and different from the previous two UI layouts, you have the option to switch the currently selected series as well. Similar UI concepts apply to car selection as well. By default, a horizontal grid type view where the select button will be right of center and from the top or bottom left, you can select the all cars view. And then another horizontal grid list where all cars is available from the top left. And again, a list view where again, you can also switch the currently selected series. And note that you can select one type of view for tracks and another for cars. It will be a matter of finding the view option that's right for you. And it could perhaps be based on the amount of content available in the currently selected series. With the track view selection in list view, we'll select the spa endurance layout. And with the car list also in this view, we'll select the Ferrari 488 GT3. Selecting customize for any car will open it in the showroom view. Holding the left click on your mouse, you can rotate the view up, down, left and right. And holding the right click and dragging, you can zoom in and out. And from upgrade on the left, you can choose the available options. And which, if it's a licensed car, will be based on the real world regulations or balance of performance parameters. Here you can see the position lights being turned on and off. And once selected, you can force any changes here for the currently selected track. There are livery options here, which I've looked at. However, it's not clear to me, since I understood that templates for custom liveries should be edited in Photoshop and saved as DDS files or something like that. And selecting the lock icon on the upper left shows or hides this options panel. And now back to the race page. To configure our single player session, we'll click session settings. In any page here, click more to read the full description. And before we begin proper, something I noticed is that it's possible to zero all of the number of session values. And when you select race, it will load a 30 minute test day session, which appears to be a fallback setup when there are no session parameters added. Or if you set up a session for just a race and use the restart weekend option, you'll be offered a practice session as well. As an example, we'll add one of each session type and examine the setup parameters. Firstly, in the settings page under general settings, time scale, we'll look at this in more detail later. Flag rules can be full, full without disqualification, black only or none. Black only means there will be no penalties except for a black flag. And full without disqualification gives you flexibility for testing or practicing. Fuel usage and tire wear can be off normal or a multiplier of up to seven. And setting the simple weather type here will apply the same value to all practice, qualifying and race sessions or vice versa. Changing the weather setting in any of the sessions applies that change to all sessions and in the sessions page too. Mechanical failure can be off, normal or time scaled, and there is also a damage multiplier which is percentage based. And these values and the damage multiplier setting from the sessions page are inherited from the difficulty settings page which we looked at earlier. Here we have a graphic 
showing the elements from the sessions page on the upper left, from the opponents page on the lower left, and on the right the difficulty page. On the right outlined in blue are the difficulty elements, which are included in both the sessions and opponents pages on the left. And the sessions page includes outlined in red an additional mechanical failure option, and which for the player is managed by the invulnerability option in the difficulty page. When in a race session, you can still edit the difficulty settings except for the AI strength and the AI limiter. The settings you apply in the difficulty page should be reflected in the sessions and opponents pages. If you find they're not, then try restarting the game. The settings from the difficulty screen not appearing in the sessions and opponents pages may be a bug. I'll pin a comment below and add a note once it's been resolved. When out on track, enabling invulnerability, which you can turn on and off at any time, prevents damage to the player, but not any AI opponents. And if you have fuel usage or tire wear on, those will still function as normal. When invulnerability is on or off, you can use the vehicle status and driving aids elements of the HUD MFD to monitor things. In the opponents page, you can set the number of AI drivers, AI strength, AI aggression and an AI limiter. Reduce the number of AI drivers in a race and remember that AI performance can be track dependent and the amount of AI drivers is not to be confused with the visible vehicle settings in the display settings page. Here you can set the amount of AI cars you want to include in a session, while visible vehicles would be the amount you can see on screen appearing around you. AI strength is the difficulty, how fast they go, and keep in mind that the AI drives a different car than you. They drive on a different set of physics to aid CPU performance, and with a simpler physics model, allowing them to handle better. So dialing up the AI too high may make them too overpowered, giving them tons of grip and advantages over you, the player. AI aggression controls how aggressive they are, how willing they are to pass or pass on the inside. Some examples might be 30 to 40 percent for open wheel cars, or 50 to 60 percent for GT style cars. If you're racing against AI that are in a faster car, turn the AI aggression down and turn it up if you're racing against a slower car. For oval circuits, turn it up to enable the AI to pass more efficiently. The AI limiter controls the level of variance between the AI drivers. At 0% you get the full range of values, so the fast guys are really fast and the slow guys are slow. By turning it up you put a cap on the difference, so the slower guys will be closer to the fast guys. And the use of it will vary depending on the type of circuit you're running. And for oval circuits similar to AI aggression, you may also want to turn up the AI limiter. The effects of any of these settings will vary depending on the type of car or track you are running, so experiment to find out what works best for you. And in addition to checking these values, you should always include a qualifying session, and in particular, 
if you set up multi-class races. And don't make the qualifying session too short. And don't include too many AI drivers. Use time acceleration if you need to complete the qualifying session, rather than using the next session or finish session options while the session is still running. In the opponent screen, the opponent's list on the right will be auto-populated based on the currently selected car, and you can then add or remove opponents as you wish. And as we discussed earlier, if you create a custom series containing a specific list of cars, it makes it easier when setting up an opponent's list. This section took me a while to figure out, since I was hoping to include as many of the concepts as possible. I ended up creating an image of some of the session setup parameters, which I'll try and utilize here. So we have one of each type of race event selected, and the timescale options are now in the sessions page, except for practice, which still contains timescale options. The timescale options are none, normal, a multiplier of up to 60 times, and use race percentage. With timescale set to normal, a 30 minute race lasts 30 minutes. A 30 minute race with a timescale multiplier of 24 would be a 12 hour race in 30 minutes. So if we wanted to replicate the 12 hours of Sebring, we'd set a start time for 12 midday for 30 minutes with a multiplier of 24 and finish around midnight. The use race percentage uses the race time you set as a multiplier, so a 12 minute race at Sebring starting at midday would also run for 12 hours finishing at midnight. And we already noted with the new user interface the time scale options have been moved to the sessions page on the left and only a practice session setup retains the timescale options. And changes to the timescale value in the sessions page are reflected in the practice page and vice versa. So for a practice session, you can apply a timescale and set private practice to on, to practice on your own, or off to practice alongside AI cars on track. The start time options are the same for all sessions, with random, random date time, default or set a time. Note that with practice qualifying and warm up sessions, the default value will be assigned a time. I selected a race session starting at Sebring at 3pm, and the practice default was 5pm, and qualifying and warm up at 4pm. These values appear to be determined by the currently selected track. For Lime Rock Park starting at 3pm, the practice default was 11am, qualifying 2pm and warm up 9.30am. And practice time can be up to 1440 minutes, which is 24 hours. Qualifying also includes a private on or off option. The start time options are the same as practice, and the number of qualifying laps can be a default of 12 or up to 254 laps, and qualifying time can also be up to 1440 minutes, which is 24 hours. For a warm up session, you just select the start time value, click on more to read the full description. Setting up a race begins with the race start type. This can be standing, formation standing, rolling, fast rolling, or track start. We'll show quick examples at Virginia International Raceway. A standing start. A formation lap to a standing start.
a rolling start, which in this example is a formation lap into a rolling start. A fast rolling start. A track start, which is the default for this track, which appears to be a standing start. The start time options, again, are random, random date time, default or specify a time. The default start time at Virginia International Raceway appears to be 4 p.m. And at Le Mans, with the race start type set to track, we get a standing start to a formation lap and the default start time appears to be 3 p.m. And a quick final example. At the Indianapolis Oval Track, the start type appears to be a formation lap into a rolling start behind a safety car. And then as part of a race setup, we have race laps, race time and finish criteria. Now the combination of these can get complicated, so bear with me. I'll present them here as a static image, so you can see the relevant values as they change. With finish criteria set to laps, you can select a maximum of 1500 laps and race time is not applicable. And the opposite with finish criteria set to time. You can race a session of up to 1000 440 minutes, which is 24 hours, and race laps is not applicable. And then a finish criteria combined of laps and time, with the maximum of 1550 laps and 1440 minutes, if you really have nothing better to do. The other three finish criteria are percentage based, so percentage track laps, percentage track time, or percentage track default, A note that setting a timescale multiplier has no effect on any of these settings. Percentage track lapse is to a maximum of 200% and where race time is not applicable. At SPA, percentage track lapse set to 100% will give you 143 laps and at 200% twice that at 286 laps. And at Le Mans, percentage track laps set to 100% will give you 397 laps, the record number of laps from the 24 hours of Le Mans. Percentage track time is to a maximum of 200% and where race laps is not applicable. At 100% you get a time of 24 hours and a max of 200% is also 24 hours. Percentage track default is to a maximum of 200% for both laps and time. And at Le Mans, you get a maximum of 397 laps over 24 hours. And the final parameter for a race setup would be the grid position, which can be set to either random or up to a position of 104. All three session types, practice, qualify and race, include track conditions using the real road settings. These can be naturally progressing based on a preset green or user auto saved. The auto save preset is created when you first load a track in a session. As an example, we'll select the all chicanes layout of Lime Rock Park, and with a practice session selected, check the available real road presets. We'll then load the practice session.
and when we exit and select the presets again, a user autosave entry has been created. And these files are stored inside your RFractor 2 installation in user data, then player, then settings, and where each layout of a track will have its own folder. And here you can see the autosave file that was generated when we first loaded the track. Some tracks, such as the Imola DLC track by Rytsa Studios, that's available in the R Factor 2 item store, contain custom named real road presets. Another feature is the ability to save real road data as presets. In this example, we're running the endurance layout of SPA, and after a practice session, we exit the session and open the event info page and click save real road on the lower left and give it a name to use it as a preset for the next session on that track. And when we want to use that data, we select it as a preset. And the file has been created inside the folder for that track layout in our settings folder. One example of using the real road system could be to start a practice session with real road set to green or whichever preset is available for the current track. Then set your qualifying and race sessions with real road naturally progressing. And then continue to use those settings each time you load that track or save a real road file for that track to use as a preset the next time you drive on it. And one use of a saved real road file as a preset could be if you have been practicing for an event on a track and wish to keep practicing on similar conditions. And then a saved real road file could be used for a qualifying session and another for a race session to simulate the conditions you wish to have. Note however that these real road settings only function when the simple weather system for each event is set to scripted. When simple weather is not set to scripted, real road will be set to default. And the real road system also offers time scale functions and which are not affected by the simple weather selection. These can be static with a multiplier of 0.1 to 0.9, normal with a multiplier of 1.5 to 15, or based on a session percentage. As we noted earlier, any weather setting applied on the sessions page will be inherited by any practice, qualify or race sessions. Before applying any custom weather settings, perhaps check your display settings to see if the unit settings are set to your preference. With the simple weather preset set to cloudy, if we modify any of the parameters below it, the preset will automatically switch to scripted and we can then proceed to modify each percentage section of the race to change the weather conditions and the ambient temperature. We can compare tracks to see if, for example, the default weather settings differ. We'll check by switching to Le Mans, and the default is partially cloudy. And if we then switch back to Spa, we can see that the default is light clouds. As a test, we'll set up a practice session with the preset for sunny conditions and create a scripted version where in each stage, the chance of rain is 100%. Just going left from zero will give you 100%. And because the simple weather is now scripted, we can also customize the real road preset. As you can see, it's now raining in the session. We'll make it a 15 minute session so we can quickly use time acceleration and for the first 
50% of the session, set the rain trance to zero. And the rain then starts during the latter half of the practice session. Any scripted simple weather settings we apply here are not inherited by any other sessions. And since they are all scripted, we can apply a real road preset as well. We can then take all the options we've gone through to set up a race event using all four race session types and while doing so examine the options there as well. Firstly we'll go to the game settings and review our current difficulty settings. We can turn invulnerability on and disable it at any time if we like. We'll also enable auto clutch. We'll be driving a GT3 car so most likely not needed but just to prevent any engine stalling in general and we can anyway disable it if we don't need it. Then we set our damage multiplier and AI options. Then we return to the session settings and check the general settings setup. And in case our difficulty settings have not been mirrored in our session setup, we can check those values as well and set the AI driver's amount to 25. And the AI opponents will be a mix of GT3 and GTE cars. We'll set the practice session of one hour to start at 10 a.m with time scale normal, overcast conditions using the scripted simple weather method so that we can customize each race session. There will be no chance of rain and real road will be set to green with a time scale of normal. Qualifying starts at 1 p.m. later that same day for 40 minutes with a three lap requirement and with scripted light clouds and rain, a 50% chance of rain and 20 degrees Celsius and real road will be set to naturally progressing with a time scale of normal. A warm up session at 12 midday and what would be the following day and the race session using the track default for spa starting at 3 p.m. and again for 40 minutes. Overcast and stormy conditions with a 100% chance of rain and 17 degrees Celsius. And again, real road will be set to naturally progressing with a time scale of normal. Before continuing a side note of sorts, I was planning to run the race for 30 minutes with a time scale value of 12 specified in the sessions page. So it would be then a six hour race over 30 minutes. I had planned to use the time acceleration function to complete the qualifying session. But since qualifying would also use the timescale value from the sessions page, that wouldn't work as such, or at least not how I had planned it. So I then decided to set all sessions to run at normal speed and use the time acceleration function during qualifying as I had planned. Now, while I don't wish to discuss the old user interface, I mean, it's time to move on. That system had separate time scale options for all three session types, so you could customize it as you pleased. So I'm not sure I completely follow the logic of the new system. Anyway, moving on. We click race to start the session and wait for the practice session to load. When the session loads, you'll be in the watch screen. On the right is the current standings information. And if you click on a car, you'll see its current position in the camera window on the left. If you click expand below the driver name, you'll get more information on their current status. Click on setup below to access the setup menu. And the summary page here on the left uses the same concept as the summary page in the settings pages. So clicking on the links around the car take you to those pages or navigate using the left and right controls 
are the buttons at the base of the screen. You can manage load and save setups from the upper left of the summary page. And in the setup screen, the default option allows you to place the car back to its default setup should you need to. And using the various screens such as fuel, gears and tires etc, you can set up your pitch strategy and build a setup. And in the electronics page, you can check whether assists such as traction control or ABS are available for the current car. And then we select drive to enter the session. Modify the camera, field of view and seat position if necessary. Then start and check the mirror arrangement and other HUD elements such as the lower stats bar, tack and HUD MFD. We can check the status screen of the HUD MFD along with the aids page to remind ourselves which of the difficulty elements we've already enabled. You can monitor the event by using the escape key to exit out to the watch screen and through the camera view, monitor the cars out on track. Clicking the camera icon displays the camera angle links which we can use to switch between the various views available. You can also use the field of view controls to change some of these views. And we can use the lower right of the camera window to go into full screen view and then continue to switch between camera views and use the arrows to switch between the cars out on track. And we can use the play controls to pause, fast forward or rewind the current camera view. If you move your mouse to the upper part of the screen, you'll see the driver names and numbers scrolling by and clicking on each entry will display that car. Then we can exit the full screen view and check the event info view. In this active track map view, you can click on the car numbers moving around to display the driver info in the standings and sectors views on the right and clicking the arrow on the lower left of the map will expand the view. The session controls are available from the upper left of the watch screen and here you can switch between sessions, restart an event and manage the AI. Clicking add AI will randomly add an AI car. While clicking the plus on the right will allow you to add an AI using a specific car number based on the opponent list added to the current session. And then selecting an AI driver on the right and clicking the boot button on the left will boot them from the session. Clicking the icon on the upper right corner brings up the alerts and chats view. Race control is at the time of writing a placeholder for functionality to be added later. We'll now use the session controls to skip to the next session which is qualifying. 
and we'll use the time acceleration to speed through the session. And again, we can use the camera view to monitor the cars as they complete their qualifying laps. And it's important to let the qualifying session fully complete. We can then use the finish session options in the session controls to move to the next session, which is warm up. And we can then use the session controls again to move on to the next session, which is the race. We can use the setup screen to load the setup if we happen to have one. And then click drive to enter the race. Note that unlike practice and qualifying, pressing escape during a race to exit to the session monitor screen results in a menu of options, including exit to monitor, restart race, instant replay and cancel. So you can select cancel to continue, use the instant replay option, which you can watch fully or use the replay control to stop it and then use the pause control to continue or just restart the race. To access R Factor 2 multiplayer, you can either click customize on the lower right of the main screen or from the main screen click race. The result is the same, so whichever works best for you. Then click more to access the multiplayer server browser. Or if you have any favorites already added and those are live, click refresh to access them directly from here. If the UI default is the horizontal scrolling list, you may wish to change it to the vertical list. Again, whatever works best for you. The filter on the left allows you to sort the server list by servers that are not full of players, servers that have players, servers that are public, so are not password protected, servers running the same core version of R Factor 2 as you, since dedicated servers also need to be kept up to date, or servers that have no AI players included. Perhaps the simplest way to use these is to check all of them, so you get a list of servers that have spaces for players to join, have actual live players, are not password protected and are not populated with AI and are running the same version of the game as you are. I'm running a server to test with so we'll search for it by name and add as a favourite if we plan to run a server with that name again. And if that favourite is live, the next time you go to access multiplayer it should appear in the multiplayer section of the race page. The server list types are those on the internet, meaning R Factor 2 dedicated servers. LAN servers, so those perhaps on the same local network as you. Favorites, if you happen to have any saved that are live. And friends, which in this case are friends on Steam, who are playing R Factor 2 and have joined that server. So we'll now join a server and select a car, or in this case a livery, or skin as they are referred to. And then we wait for the server to load, and if we didn't have this content already installed, it would be served to us. We can then use the info on the watch page, such as camera, event info and sectors and standings lists, to see who is currently on the server. It's possible to share car setups between players on the same server. From the setup screen, find the setup you want to share and load it up. Then click share 
and pick the name of the driver you want to share your setup with and again click share. Then the player receiving the setup loads up the setups window and on the right will see a received setup. Click on the name of the player who shared it and load the setup. You can then modify that setup further if necessary and save it. And note that the setups shared with you are stored in a received folder in the settings folder of your player directory. When joining a multiplayer server, you can select either drive or spectate. And when in spectator mode, you click passenger and select a car from the list. Replays can be accessed either by going from the main screen and selecting watch and then more, or by selecting watch from the upper left, the result is the same. Once you've clicked more to access the list for the first time, you will be presented with a horizontal list. I usually use the vertical list version myself. You can then select the replay to load. There will be letters on the end of the session name indicating what type of session the replay is. So P for practice, R for race, WU for warm up and Q for qualifying. And the file size of the replay will be an indication of its length. If in this case, like me, you have lots of short segments created while testing. You can then select an item and click watch. Once the replay has loaded, you can click resume to begin driving again in this session type. I'm not going to go into specific details on how to set up replay controls. That would require a separate dedicated tutorial. In this example, I'm going to use a combination of keyboard controls and an Xbox 360 controller setup as a custom controller profile. And under display, and other is where most of the relevant control options are located. We can use the camera view to watch the replay and if we then go to full screen view, we can switch between the camera views and drivers and use the slider controls to scrub through the session. Then we'll pause the replay and begin to use the free look option to move around the scene. If you plan to use the free look option, make sure to assign both free look and zero free look to keyboard keys or controller buttons so that you can turn the free look off should you need to access the on-screen menus again. We'll then look for a time and angle to take a screenshot or record a custom replay. Then use a mix of free look, camera movement and swingman camera movement to find the angle we're looking for. If you find this video useful, I would appreciate subscribing to the channel and adding a like and a comment below if you have any comments or questions. I'll include links to this tutorial and my dedicated server tutorial below. So if you know someone who is interested in R Factor 2, wants help getting started or is already playing it but could maybe use some tips, then please share the links with them. Until next time, thank you.